Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming out. Uh, welcome back to the Hilltop. Welcome back to SMU and the Center for Presidential History in what is now, believe it or not, our 10th anniversary year. So, um, yeah, hold your, I mean, really, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I think a decade of Brian and Rana and, and Mai's life should be applauded. Uh, so, thank you for coming back, and we look forward to a wonderful year with you. And in fact, if you'll please be sure to mark your calendars for March, we're going to have a rather large, one might even say massive, uh, 10th anniversary celebration uh, over in McFarland Auditorium. Uh, we're going to have Peter Baker and Susan Glasser, uh, New York Times Chief White House Correspondent, and... Um, what is she, staff writer for The New Yorker, uh, respectively, whose book you've probably heard of this week because it's coming out this week, and he writes for The New York Times, so he has a good, pretty good forum. Uh, and all the revelations from their book are coming out day by day by day. So if you'd like to know what the re revelations are, I assure you, it's on the front page. So please mark your calendars for that. We also have another uh, variety of events going forward which I want to highlight. In particular, we are continuing our renewal of our CPH study trips, our travel tours. Of course, where we bring uh, together uh, SMU alumni, or as I like to put them, friends of the university, because you need not actually have a degree in order to join us, and SMU students. And we travel around the world. Last couple of years, actually last year, we went both to Pearl Harbor for the uh, uh, 80th anniversary actually anniversary is not the right word, commemoration uh, of the Pearl Harbor attack on December 7th. <clears throat> uh, we were there, luckily, during the period where Hawaii got its first snow in 55 years. That was not expected. Uh, you can imagine the looks on the faces of the students who I had promised they could perhaps go surfing, and instead they went skiing. Not intended. And we also went to Germany and uh, Czechoslovakia, excuse me, Czech Republic, and looked at uh, the end of the Cold War and the end of World War II. And I mention this because the trips, frankly, keep getting better and better. And this next year, uh, coming up in this June, we are going to go to France to study World War I on the Western Front. Uh, and if you've never been to those battlefields, I highly recommend them as historic sites. I also recommend them because they are conveniently located in the Champagne region, um, and it's, it's always touring season, if you will. And of course, we're going to be talking about, if you will, more cerebral topics, less alcoholic. Uh, over the course of the semester, over the course of the year, we're going to be talking about missiles. We're going to be talking about politics, obviously. Uh, we're going to be talking about petroleum. We're actually very excited to be bringing back one of our former postdocs to present his book. That's always a particular uh, thrill for me when we get one of those people who has accomplished what we want them to do and what they want to do in, in advancing their careers. Uh, and in fact, I'm very excited to also announce that we actually right now have the largest cohort of postdoctoral fellows that we've ever had which is to say we keep expanding. Uh, we're now up to six postdoctoral fellows. I mean, you may have noticed their, their images up on the screen beforehand. And we're very excited to have them um, here and to help advance their careers because we know that's the best way to ensure that future generations actually get some good history is to make sure they learn it from us along the way. So without further ado, uh, I'm going to turn us over to the topic at hand. And I want to actually turn us over to our associate director, Brian Franklin. But I want to tell you why. Uh, which is to say, we've been at SMU, we collectively, the world, we have been at SMU for 10 years. I personally have been in Texas for 18 years, which means I am just qualified to vote as a Texan. But Brian Franklin reminded me I am still not qualified to call myself an actual Texan. So we are going to bring out an actual Texan to proceed on from here. So if you'll please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Brian Franklin. To be clear, I would never say something like that. Uh, Davy Crockett was a real Texan, and he was here for like weeks. So you can be a real Texan, too. Uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, for tonight, I want to thank my CPH colleagues who are here to help make this all happen, especially Rana Spitz. Uh, I want to thank Jonathan Angulo. I don't know if he's here, but he has um, helped me to uh, conceive of this event. There he is over there, PhD student in the SMU History Department, and the Debman College Interdisciplinary Institute and their Scott Hawkins Lecture Fund, which is helping to um, underwrite tonight. Uh, this event was really born out of kind of two major threads in my mind 
and I suppose those happen particularly in a Texan mind. Uh, one was recent politics, recent elections. The 2020 election, just a couple of years ago, you may remember that one of the big questions that was being covered nationally was the, quote, Hispanic vote, or the, quote, Latino vote, and how it went, especially in the states of Florida and Texas, and the surprises that many people felt after that. And in the last couple of years, that has not slowed down. If you watch politics, you watch the news, then you've seen things about these special elections, elections in South Texas that are pitting Republican and Democrat uh, Latino or Latina people against one another. You've seen recently with the overturning of Roe v. Wade and its reverberations, particularly in Latinx or Hispanic Catholic communities. So it's very much a live issue. And then the second thread here is the growing historical interest in the role of Tejano people in particular in this state. And these two strands, you know, like a lot of historical strands, are always colliding, but they seem especially hot the last couple years, and so I thought with those two strands coming together in this Texan brain, perhaps it might be coming together in some other people's brains, and we would want to talk about it. And the best way to talk about these sorts of things um, is openly and with people, ideally, who really know what they're talking about. And so that's who we've got here tonight, Jack Herrera and Max Crockmall. Jack Herrera is senior editor at Texas Monthly, covering immigration, Latino issues, and elections. Uh, just a, well, maybe it was almost a year ago, this is one of his cover stories right here, uh, Why Democrats Are Losing Tejanos. And he writes regularly for Texas Monthly. He's also written for Politico, Business Insider, The Pacific Standard, and many, many other outlets. In my opinion, you're just not going to find contemporary writing like his just anywhere. It's really, truly complex work on the diverse world of Tejano politics and society, so we're really thrilled to have him here. And then second, we have Max Krokmal, who is not actually a stranger. He is now a professor of history in the Czech Republic endowed professor and director of justice studies at the University of New Orleans. Previously, he was at TCU, and most importantly, he was a fellow here at SMU at the Clement Center for Southwest Studies just down the hall. He's the author and editor of two major books. The first is this one, Blue Texas, The Making of a Multiracial Democratic Coalition in the Civil Rights Era. And the second one, this one, both for sale outside, by the way, Civil Rights and Black and Brown, Histories of Resistance and Struggle in Texas. This one is sort of a two-part book that includes both the stories, the oral histories of people who participated in the civil rights movement and scholars who are now writing about that. Uh, some of those people might actually be in this room. Um, he's a true, he would not say this about himself, but he is a hub in and of himself for the study of civil rights history, especially among uh, Tejano people. So we're really thrilled to have him as well. So tonight, our format will be just a little different than what we typically do. First, I'm going to invite each speaker up for roughly 10 minutes for each of them to sort of share their own thoughts and their own experiences from their own fields of journalism and of history on this topic. And then um, I'll come back and transition us where the two of them will kind of come sit over here together and have a bit of a conversation, get the pump primed for us to talk together. And then in the third part, I'll come back up here and we'll have the mics ready for you where we hope that you'll be ready with your questions about this really important topic. All right, so let's start tonight um, with, as I told them earlier, I felt like it was only proper that we start with the history first. So I wanna invite up uh, Dr. Max Crockmall. All righty, well thank you Brian for the great introduction and for having me here. I'm setting my timer because uh, he asked me to talk about these two huge books in 10 minutes. Uh, so try to keep myself on, on track here, but it's wonderful to be back here at SMU. I went to a bunch of talks in this room and it's kind of surreal to be up here. Uh, but thank you to again Brian for having me and, and Jeff and for Rana for all your work in, in getting us here. So today we're gonna talk about the Latino vote. Um, I'm going to tell you the history of this concept, uh, and I'm telling you the history of something that really doesn't exist. Right? So um, it's aspirational, the Latino vote, and it always has been, and it probably always will be. Um, and so that's my first big point, and then I'm going to walk you through, I guess, this history, the efforts to create a Latino vote uh, out of a group of people that um, is incredibly diverse, 
uh, wide ranging in terms of experience, uh, class, politics, ideology, strategy, tactics, residency, migration status, language, religion, we could keep going, uh, gender, sexuality, ability, and so on. Um, but people from this very diverse group at different junctures have tried to come together and form a unified political entity, uh, much as people have tried to organize other ethnic and racial groups into uh, organized political fashion. So um, yeah, I'm gonna talk a little fast <laughs> because I have this huge pile in front of me, but um, I wanna tell you just a little story about where did this concept come from? Where is it that we get this, uh, the current sort of iterations of, of the Latino vote? Um, so the story begins in the beginning, there was segregation. Right? Texas began, uh, <clears throat> of course, uh, as uh, part of Spain and Mexico, but then um, after the Texian secession, it became a, a state dominated by white settlers. Um, right? White settlers, of course, engaged in enslavement and later um, in various kinds of uh, extractive enterprises, including in South Texas, commercial agriculture. So people who lived in South Texas before the Texians came, um, many of them could trace their lineage back very far. I learned today that the Herreras go back to the 1780s it was right, in Texas um, and, and many other groups. Uh, but the, this, um, as Anglo growers came from the Midwest into South Texas, they redrew the state's politics. They redrew the region's politics. They literally created new counties um, they created, of course, new cities, they created new industries, and they needed a labor force. And they were happy to have uh, people who were long-term Mexican-descended residents of the region, as well as more recent migrants, coming and working for them in the fields, and, um, and doing so with low wages, um, uh, virtually no education system, and political disfranchisement. So that was the beginning of the story, right? A system I call, and others call, Juan Crow, Juan Crow segregation. Uh, which was in fact a, uh, a system that was rooted in law, a de jure system of segregation, not just a de facto one. Um, and political disfranchisement was one piece in, in which the state oversaw this system of segregation. Law enforcement, schools, there are a bunch of other ones as well. Um, but for our purposes, we're talking politics, right? So we all know about the history of bossism along the border. Most of us who study Texas know that there were powerful Anglo bosses who emerged um, many of them were uh, what one scholar has called Mexicanized Anglos. They had, they had um, married into prominent Tejano families in the border region. They often practiced Catholicism, um, but they built things like the King Ranch, right, or, or uh, other major empires in South Texas. And in Duval County and elsewhere, we see the rise of political bosses who are uh, Anglo -Mexican, Mexicanized Anglo intermediaries who wield the Mexican vote, right? Um, so, Prior, throughout this age of segregation, which we can say goes at least through the 1930s, if not the 1950s, um, Mexicans who voted in Texas did so predominantly through the boss system, which meant that they did not wield an independent vote. There was nothing democratic, small d, about any of this, right? They were told to uh, pile up in the truck. Someone paid their poll taxes for them, took them to the polls, and told them how to vote the right way. And if they varied from that, they very quickly would have to find a new place to live and work. That was basically the system. So I want to talk most of the time today about my research, which is on the civil rights era, right? The next period, beginning in the 1930s, continuing into the 1970s. Um, and there were sporadic fits and starts throughout the 30s and 40s to organize Mexican Americans for political purposes. Um, there, I'm gonna, it, it, th those were important interventions, for example, in 1948. Uh, the attorney, Gus Garcia, uh, ran for and won a seat on a local school board in San Antonio uh, by forming a political coalition uh, with an African-American who was also running for office uh, as an independent and, and, and was elected as well to a community college board. Uh, he was the first African-American elected in South Texas since Reconstruction, right? So this big moment, and it was a political coalition in San Antonio, 1948, um, that really rocked the city's power structure and alarmed many observers and caused a series of reforms, including the founding in San Antonio of the Good Government League, which some of you may know was a, a mechanism by which elite Anglos could control elections and did so very successfully for the next two decades. Um, so there, those experiments, lots of those experiments, very important. 
uh, an organized Latino vote really took off in the 1950s. I'm going to have to talk faster. It uh, really took off in the 1950s when Albert Pena, an organizer in San Antonio, began trying to build a conscious Latin bloc. Um, and they called themselves, of course, Latin Americans at that juncture. Their first organization actually didn't mention ethnicity at all. It was called the Loyal American Democrats. Uh, in, San Ant in Houston, there was another early organization founded in the late 50s called the Civic Action Committee. And despite their names, they were very much engaging in ethnic politics. Um, they were trying to help people organize, pay their poll taxes. Albert Pena and Olga Pena, his wife, built the first card files and systematic get out the vote efforts in the south side of San Antonio. And, um, and they uh, very much put racial justice issues at the center of their work, as well as economic justice issues. But one thing that set them apart was an effort to build independent politics, right? To build an independent Latino political power, independent power for their neighborhoods, for their barrios, separate from the boss machines, separate from Anglo elites and from Latino intermediaries, which existed in places like San Antonio or um, most famously maybe Laredo, places with large Mexican American populations, by this point had a business class that served as sort of diplomats in their communities. But Albert Pena and John J. Herrera of Houston and others sought to build instead an independent political apparatus in which Latinos could put forward their own politics uh, and, and organize together around that. Um, one major breakthrough moment for this politics was in 1960 when Albert Pena, along with Dr. Hector P. Garcia of the GI Forum and Henry Gonzalez of San Antonio, who Pena had helped elect to his first offices there as well, the three of them became the co-chairs in, in Texas for the Viva Kennedy campaign, for the, the Latin wing of the Kennedy-Johnson campaign. And this was a moment in which they were able to uh, really assert themselves as, again, an ethnic bloc. They were able to turn out voters. Uh, they were able to register voters. Um, they were able to gain a certain amount of recognition from within the Anglo political system. It wasn't the first time, but it was a breakthrough, a watershed moment. Um, and coming out of that successful victory, uh, Kennedy sends them a telegram that says, thank you for your incredible work. The Viva Kennedy organization was hugely important in our success in Bear County and all along the Rio Grande Valley. Um, of course, Kennedy and Johnson just narrowly carried Texas that year, uh, and it was because of Latino and African American votes. Um, and, and so after that election, Pena and others hoped to claim the spoils. Um, they wanted to achieve appointments in Washington. They wanted to represent their communities in more official capacities. And for some members of their organization, which came to be known as the Political Association of Spanish-Speaking Organizations, or PASO, for some of them, that was about their own advancement, right? They wanted a career, they wanted a good government job, they wanted to go to Washington. Uh, but for many, it was about an understanding that uh, American politics needed their expertise. They needed, they needed Latinos, bilingual, bicultural people in high places in order to uh, create better public policy and better outcomes and to lift Latinos out of poverty, right, in this, at the time, right, and still the wealthiest nation in the world. Um, moving forward, as Pena and others continue to try to build this movement, there are a million factional splits. And this takes me back to where I started the talk, right, with, uh, that there is no such thing as a Latino vote, right, that there is no Latino community. So there was tremendous disagreement. Um, Hector B. Garcia, for his, uh, all of his work, was uh, a, a bit of a lightning rod. He was very cautious. He was very closely connected to Lyndon Johnson. Uh, some people even described him as a client of Johnson. And so... Uh, he was, uh, at various junctures, strongly opposed to the idea of building a more uh, self-consciously liberal and pro-labor uh, Latino vote uh, that Pena and others sought to organize. And so there were frequent conflicts there. And every time Paso had a meeting, one faction got up and walked out. Right? They, could, they never had a successful convention without a walkout. Um, right. <laughs> However... That didn't, wasn't always a bad thing, right? Because this dream of ethnic unity and, and, and building this monolith was always just that, right? It was always aspirational. Uh, and so for Albert Pena and for other people uh, among liberals and the left, uh, they saw this also as an opportunity to, uh, to build new alliances. And so while they responded to protracted intra-ethnic conflicts with new efforts to build inter-ethnic coalitions. Uh, they built alliances with the black civil rights movement. They built alliances with the left wing of the Democratic Party, a faction that was very much pro-New Deal, pro self-identified independent liberals, uh, as well as with the labor movement, a white-led organized labor movement, the Texas AFL-CIO and others. And they came together and formed something that they called the Democratic Coalition throughout the early 1960s. 
And this was a group that was trying to push the party into the liberal, into liberal hands uh, and to get there by advocating for, um, for civil rights, for integration immediately, uh, and by really prioritizing African-American and Mexican-American racial justice issues. Um, I think there's a lot of evidence to suggest they were wildly successful, right? They didn't elect a governor, which was one of their main goals, but they did break open the political system of the state, as I write about in my book. Uh, they were able to build a massive ground operation with volunteer uh, uh, block workers that registered more people, uh, more unlikely voters in the, in the inner cities and in the barrios and in uh, rural areas uh, populated by Latinos. And, um, and they were able to ultimately redraw the maps of urban politics so that we have now today, right, the big red state with all these little blue dots, right? Those blue dots came from these kinds of organizing efforts that I chart in my book. Um, of course, some years later, some of Pena's uh, younger supporters, mentees, and others uh, built the Mexican-American Youth Organization and later a third political party, the Raza Unida Party, which represented a direct challenge to the Democratic Party. To back up real quick, and then I'm going to shut up, right? The Democratic Party was the only party in town, right? Throughout the period I'm talking about, the only option. You couldn't get elected dog catcher if you weren't a Democrat. So all politics happened within the party, all factional disputes. Um, we think of, uh, of the, sh the realignments that have happened in politics as happening from the top down, but they also happen from the bottom up with various groups coming along, including this liberal pro-labor faction of, of Mexican-Americans, of Latinos, who broke open the doors of the Democratic Party and made it their own. Uh, and the Raza Unida Party represented another challenge to the Democratic power elite in the state. And what happened after that is an era I might call uh, a moment of incorporation, right, in which the Democratic Party finally responded by taking Latino voting issues more seriously, by trying to develop Latino leaders, by forming the Mexican-American Democrats and the Tejano Democrats, and actually becoming the party that you might think of it is today, right? At the same time, Republicans and others tried to build coalitions that involved Latinos very conscientiously beginning in the 1960s, and, um, and, and so that other faction of more conservative-minded Latinos didn't go anywhere, but also found a new home, right? And those factional and political divides continue today. Um, so that was the very, very quick version, <laughs> and I look forward to more conversation. Thank you. Yeah, as a journalist, I'm always nervous talking to historians because I learn the stories that I'm focusing on the current day and I think there's some, you know, some revelation, some news, something new has happened. A historian lets me know that you know, that's been going on for 50 years, or that has a history that starts 100 years ago. And it's a little bit stressful that I think that I have to go back, you know, do a PhD to report a, a single story sometimes, <laughs> try and figure out the background. Uh, I don't I often get a chance to talk about my work. And so I thought that this would be an interesting opportunity to not just tell the story of what's happening uh, specifically in South Texas where I've been reporting for the last few years, but also how reporters are covering the story. Um, and so I have a bit of a personal story about how I came to this reporting. Uh, my grandfather died two years ago, Yermo Herrera, and uh, before he passed away, right before he passed away, he told me a story about his childhood in Laredo. Uh, in the winters, uh, the Rio Grande would flood its banks and there'd be water on the ranch land on both sides of the border. Uh, my great grandmother, was a Mexican woman named Francisca, would wake up the kids and they would. Oh, sorry. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so the, uh, uh, my great grandmother, a Mexican woman named Francisca, would shake the children awake. Oh, is that better? <laughs> sorry about that. Thanks, all. Uh, my great grandmother, Mexican woman Francisca, would shake the children awake and they would drive in a truck down the length of the river into the Rio Grande Valley. There they would work to rescue animals that had been stuck in the mud. And there were pigs up to their bellies and uh, calves treading in the water. And my grandfather, who died in 2020 at age 81, he got to miss the pandemic, so that's the bright side, um, said that he learned to swim when he was four years old when his mother told him to go catch a chicken and the chicken ran into a puddle that ended up being a bit deeper than just a puddle. Um, I have to confess that this is actually the real reason I jumped on the original assignment that put me on the path that has me here today. 
uh, in November of 2020, there's a real shock in the borderlands in South Texas as results came out from the, the uh, Trump-Biden election. In these counties along the border, Star, Cameron, Zapata, Webb County, all the southernmost counties in Texas, Trump had so massively improved his results compared to 2016 that they were just truly off the charts. In Webb County, where Biden actually still won, this shows you how strongly Democrat they were before, Republicans increased their turnout, at least around the presidential vote, by 10 times. Enormous increases, and these are repeated all across the border, all across these border regions. Just truly incredible gains. Um, these are areas that had been blue strongholds for well over 100 years, and I mean that literally. In Zapata, Texas, just south of Laredo, voters had not voted for a Republican president since William McKinley was on the ballot. <laughs> My editor asked, called me um, and asked me, basically, in as many words, do you know what the hell's going on down there? <laughs> and I thought about my family and uh, family members who still lived in South Texas and the stories that I'd grown up hearing. And I think I realized I didn't feel as shocked as my editor. And I told him, you know, I have some ideas of what's going on down there. So uh, as I drove through the, the magazine, Politico wanted me to look into you know, electoral politics. What's going on? How are Republicans gaining there? Um, and as I drove through Laredo, it's the day later, I, did, I, I knew that the real reason I was there is I was actually trying to understand my grandfather better. In the wake of his death and in my grief, I wanted to stand in the place where he had grown up and try to understand what had made him the way he was. Just like mesquite and ocelots have been shaped by the natural history of the Rio Grande, I wanted to understand what social and political history along that same river had made a person like my grandfather. And as an Herrera myself, what makes me? What heritage has shaped the possibilities of my own self-conception, my possibilities of self? You know, in the last two years, I've felt a mix of frustration uh, and excitement that editors and readers all across the country suddenly want to know everything about Tejanos or Hispanics, Latinos, South Texans, cualquier palabra que se usa. Uh, and it brings me satisfaction that this culture, which is my family's culture, has suddenly garnered national attention, but it also frustrates me that the story always gets broken down into two components, which is Democrats and Republicans. Very clearly, there's something more going on here. But let's talk about Democrats and Republicans for a second, because I know we're all interested. <laughs> I think the simplest way to answer the question, I'm gonna, give you, I'm gonna give you the simplest answer about why are Texas Hispanics shifting to the right? It's complicated. <laughs> there is no one reason, and if you're reading a reporter or you're listening to a politician or you're you know, on the radio or you see a talking head on the TV who's telling you this is why it's happening, they're not giving it to you straight. It's not monocausal. There are so many different reasons why this is happening. So let me run through a few of the hypotheses from the time I've spent all across the border in Texas. In 2020, I traveled to Zapata, that county that hadn't voted Republican since McKinley was on the ballot. Um, and here, two very obvious hypotheses were on the surface, and this is just a week after the election. The first hypothesis that explains what had happened was oil and gas. Zapata is a small and very, very poor county, and huge numbers of people depend on the oil industry for jobs. I wish I could say that there were reliable jobs, but any Texan knows that the oil industry is reliable one year and unreliable the next, but these are middle-class incomes that are really the only source uh, for that socioeconomic advancement for people in this area. And when Biden made references to a clean energy transition in his campaign, uh, notably a transition, there was no calls to end the oil and gas industry in Texas, but nonetheless, managers in the oil com uh, companies began telling workers that Biden was going to shut down the oil fields in Texas. And one of those workers I spoke to told me that he had been told that you need to vote for Trump if you don't want to be homeless. Uh, effective political messaging. The next hypothesis is that local Republicans succeeded and local Democrats failed in the 2020 election. Perhaps precisely because South Texas has voted Democrat for so long, 
local democratic parties look more like social clubs than political operations. If you want to go see a bunch of abuelos, you know, if you want to get the chisme of the community, it's a great place to go. But if you want to see politics in action, these local democratic parties, at least at that time, were not exactly doing that work. Um, and it was also uh, definitely hurt during the pandemic because uh, in 2020, Democrats made the decision to stop knocking on doors to avoid spreading the virus and instead focused on social media. Republicans, let's say, were not so scrupulous and they knocked on thousands of doors and held cookouts and posadas. Trump trains, which were lines of cars and trucks hundreds of yards long, winded their way down highways on the river. And by the time the votes were tallied in November, there was this very clear story that you could tell. Republicans had substantially and successfully out-organized Democrats. They'd actually run campaigns while Democrats had made Facebook posts. If you don't know why somebody voted Republican, for a lot of people, the answer was that the Republican was the person who vote, knocked on their door and talked to them about what was important to them. Those are the two hypotheses that I think were most obvious in those first weeks after the election. Um, but I began to think about some of the deeper answers that could explain why people vote the way they do when I began to hear a sentence that I had actually heard a lot when I was growing up. And it came up over and over again. In uh, that Zapata County, I sat uh, on a stoop in Sunset with a great grandmother named Devon, who told me the same sentence. And then in uh, Rio Grande City, I sat with a retired army colonel who said the same thing. And then in Laredo, with actually some democratic organizers who were putting out flyers, they all said the same sentence, which is, we didn't cross the border, the border crossed us. If there's a thesis for what we can call the Hano identity, I think that's it. And it's actually something I first heard when I uh, heard from my grandfather. Um, I, I had trouble sleeping one night and I was up at you know, 4 a.m. and he was an old man so he woke up at 4 a.m. and he came down the stairs and said, good, you're up, and sat me down and told me the story of my family. And as Max alluded to, uh, my first ancestor arrived in Texas in the 1780s uh, and our family's been in the area of Laredo and San Antonio ever since. And so that's something that my grandfather explained to me, that even though our family had plenty of immigrants in it, when it comes to the Herrera line, it's not precisely an immigration story. We never crossed the border, the border crossed us. I've spent a lot of time thinking about what that word means and what that self-conception means and what it means for a political identity. As a word, Tahano is indexical, which means it's changed based on who's saying it. It's meaning changes based on who's saying it. And for many people, like some of my cousins in San Antonio, Tejano is a relation to a word like Chicano. It's a way of asserting a unique identity endemic to these lands and a way of declaring one's resistance to what we might call coercive assimilation. I'm gonna stay the way I am. The way I am is good enough. In a place like Zapata or Star County, or a lot of these, count, uh, these areas that uh, broke uh, in the direction towards Trump, a sentence like, we didn't cross the border, the border crossed us, means something different. And this, of course, isn't true for everybody, but for a lot of the folks I spoke to down there, it's specifically a rejection of an immigrant identity, and more specifically, a rejection of a Mexican identity. Let me give you an example. When I asked Ross Barrera, who was a retired army colonel and who was then the chair of the Star County Republican Party, what he thought about Trump's remarks about Mexicans. I think the most famous is they're not sending their best, you know, they're, they're criminals, they're rapists. Um, I asked him what he thought about that and if it bothered him. And he told me that I don't think when people say they don't like Mexicans, oh, he said, I, I think when people say they don't like Mexicans, it means a Mexican citizen, a Mexican national, someone who crossed illegally. So when someone says they don't like Mexicans, I don't think it means you or me. And he pointed at me. I found talking to him, and this is something I've had to do a lot in my reporting, is simply ask someone, what word do you use for yourself? Because I'm going to have to use it in the article. So do you like Hispanic? And he's, Barrera says, no, I don't, I don't use Hispanic. That's, that's a word that you, know, you folks in the media use. And I said, Latino? And he's like, well, that's, that's Hollywood. You know, or maybe in Florida, you call yourself Latino. You know, like that's, that's not right. Um, Mexican-American, that's just a bit of a mouthful. Um, and so he says, you know what, I call myself Tejano. 
And I asked him to talk about more about what that means. Like, is that, is that a racial identity? Is it an ethnic identity? And he said that, you know, I think what his words were, I am Caucasian and my government says I am Hispanic because my surname goes back to Hispaniola, to Spain. So I think that for Barrera, Tajano was a way of establishing a sort of hierarchy between himself as a citizen and non-citizen Hispanics or more recent immigrants. And the way he talked often revealed an uncomfortable racial dynamic because, and I've reported on both sides of the border for a long time, I know that most of the people arriving look more indigenous than I do or than uh, Ross looked. And this isn't a point that he shared, shared, shared away from. I mean, he said, when you look at the people arriving, they don't look like you or me. And he pointed at me again. Like I've said, I don't think the shift of some Latino communities to the right is monocausal. Oil and gas plays a role. Political organizing plays a role. Inflation plays a role. Truly exhausting and unending Twitter fights about the word Latinx play a role. But if I want to make one contribution to this conversation, it's this. Race and racial formation play a role in people's politics. And I do think it plays a role in their willingness to support a candidate like Donald Trump, again, in some cases. Now, the relationship between Latinidad, you know, Latinness, Latinoness, and whiteness is complicated. As many of you likely know, the US Census asks two questions about identity, first ethnicity and first race. And if you're Latino, I, you know, I bet you've probably had an identity crisis answering the census at one point. It gives you a pretty limited amount of terms. And it's complicated, because a lot of people, when you ask them their race or identity, somebody will say, you know, like, I'm Cubano. There's no option for that on the census. So what it does ask is it asks if you're Hispanic or Latino and then asks you to name your race. And from this data, we can garner some pretty interesting observations about these counties that shifted for Trump. On the 2210 census, 53% of Americans, myself included, who answered that they were Hispanic or Latino, then went on and marked their race as white. So a slim majority of people identified that way, 53%. But in Starr County that same year, where 96% of the residents marked Hispanic, almost 99% identified as white. On paper, that means that Starr County wasn't just one of the most Hispanic counties in the country, it was also one of the whitest. Such results are common across South Texas, where Texas state demographers told me recently that 76% of residents identify as white, and that's compared to the 62% who do statewide. It's a much larger percentage. Look at Laredo. In the latest, sentence, latest census, 95% of respondents there marked Hispanic or Latino, making it the second most Hispanic city in the entire country. But 96% of those respondents identified as white. The numbers look similar in Brownsville, Zapata, and elsewhere along the Rio Grande. But here's the thing, is they're different than other Hispanic pockets in the country. In Salinas, California, for instance, on the coast near Monterey, almost 80% of census respondents selected Hispanic or Latino as their ethnicity. But then only 37% of those same respondents said that they were white. Santa Ana in Southern California is ethnically 77% Latino. Racially, only 40% of people marked white. Notably, neither Salinas or Santa Ana experienced a pronounced rightward shift in the last election, though I do think it's important to say that there was a slight rightward shift, but nowhere near as pronounced as was in South Texas. I have to say, I get nervous talking about this I think that it's a very sensitive topic for a lot of people. And I'm not at all trying to say that, oh, you know, if people identify as one race, that's how they're gonna vote. Obviously, that's the whole point of this conversation. We, where you're asking me how the Tejano people vote, how Hispanic people vote. It's always a question of a lot of different dynamics at play. But I do think that my contribution to this debate is that racial identity is playing a role. When it comes to why borderland residents seem less likely to identify as people of color, the history is complicated, and I hope we can get into it during the discussion. 
Um, but there's one story that I had a chance to uh, experience pretty recently that I wanted to end with. Uh, two weeks ago, I flew out to El Paso and drove about 300 miles down a county road that at that point was pretty much washed out. I'm glad I was in a big old truck. And I drove to this site along the border of a ghost town called Porvenir. And to say ghost town is actually an overestimation of what's left. There's absolutely nothing there. It's an empty field. There's a burned out trailer that's you know much, much younger than this town. But if you'd gone back there in 1916, 1917, it would have been a thriving village of about 140 mostly Mexican families. I had gone there because I'm tracking a, his, uh, tracking a specific history where uh, soon after Christmas, in 19, uh, beginning of the year 1918, a group of Texas Rangers, US soldiers, and some ranchers rode into town and looked for guns among the men, accusing them of being uh, raiders who had recently uh, raided a bright ranch and Anglo settlement uh, up the river. They found two guns in the whole settlement. It was very clear that these people were not bandidos. Uh, disarmed them and then left and came back three days later, tied up all the men and the boys, some of them as young as 15, marched them up to a bluff and shot all of them. The other residents that survived were so terrified, they crossed the river into Mexico and the town was no more. It does not exist anymore. I read the names of the dead recently and three of them share my name. Three Herreras were killed that day and I don't think they were my ancestors. But I do think about what it means for people that time period. My ancestors who were alive just down, down the river in Laredo in that time period. What it means when the fact that you're Mexican can put you at risk of real violence and what that does for your identity. Especially as you talked about, you know, as uh, Max talked about in Juan Crow, Texas, when identifying as white wasn't just a matter of, I don't know, like declaring what sort of music you like or what sort of food you eat, but was a way of getting access to a very specific set of civil rights. And when I think of that history and I think of my own family, who have a complicated relationship with our identity or what sort of race, you know, racial questions we can ask about ourselves, I think about this history of violence that does exist in this state and the way that the elements of power in Texas history have shaped the way people like me with a long Tejano legacy are able to see ourselves and think about ourselves today. It's probably a little bit more than 10 minutes, but <laughs> thank you all. Thank you both. Um, I'd like to give our guests the chance to just maybe ask each other a question. I know that they're probably listening to one another and have something burning in their mind. Um, but after that, then uh, we'll have a couple of mics that we'll want to pass to you. And please, if you, when we get to that portion, if you have a question, throw your hand up. Um, one of our fellows will get a mic passed down to you so that we can all hear, uh, hear you well. So um, I want to open it up to you two to maybe uh, take us to the next section here. Great. Yeah. Uh, is, this, is this working? Can everyone hear me? Can you hear me? <laughs> Great. Um, yeah, so my, first que my question for you is, in your, book, in your books, you talk about these moments um, in the you know, mythic Latino vote, Latino politics, where there's a lot of attention paid to our communities because of the organizing that was going on, because of the power that had been built, that politicians had to pay attention to us because we had political sway. And I'm wondering in this moment where all of a sudden there's all this attention paid to the Latino vote, if you think that that's indicative that in this current moment, you know, Tejano, Hispanic, Latino political power in Texas has gone up, that we have more of a say at this moment. Okay, great. Well, thank you. And that was a really great talk. I have lots of questions for you too. Um, yeah, so the, I mean, historically speaking, right, there are these moments of enhanced visibility, whether that's because of perceived threat, as in the example of Porvenir, um, right, that the moment of the Mexican Revolution and, and rebellion in the borderlands um, compelled the Texas Rangers to go and 
engaged in this reign of terror in South Texas. Or 50 years later, when the farm workers went on strike in Starr County, and um, it was at a moment, again, of, of increasing Mexican-American political power, and again, attracted the Texas Rangers who decided they didn't want to see that strike continue. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think, I think there is a bit of a pattern there. Of course, the Raza Unida Party shook up everything when it began randing people for office. And by the way, the, the, the Raza Unida Party, the United People's Party, or United Race, um, was you know this very much radical Chicano Chicana identified party, um, but they they put forward a, a simple idea that that in places where they were the numerical majority, Mexican Americans should be able to vote and they should be able to choose a candidate of their own choosing, and that person could be Mexican. Radical right? politics. Radical politics, but they won Zapata County. Yeah. Right. And they won. Uh, uh, four counties, right, in the Winter Garden, and governed them for for more than a decade in some cases, and and so um, to think about the same place that Jack was just describing as a hotbed of Chicano radicalism just a generation earlier, uh, or two generations maybe, uh, and it's the same place, right? Um, and again, to your question, they they uh, they did attract a lot of outside attention, right, because of the threat they posed to both political parties. Um, you know, now it's a it's it's hard to say. I mean, clearly the 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 immigrant rights movement has put Latinos at the center of of Texas politics in new ways. Uh, you know, the Dreamers and and every all the youth organizing that's happened over the past couple of decades, because um, we've been talking about the Dream Act that long, as well. And um, uh, and you know, the Democratic Party, of course, now has a has a Mexican American chairman, uh, and he you know, arrived uh, to great fanfare. Um, I think, uh, you know, around after 2008. Um, and, and as small and bad as the party was at organizing in South Texas, it was even smaller and more diffuse before Hinojosa arrived. Um, so yeah, I think they're on the radar in a different way. Of course, most of the Democratic caucus in Austin are, are Latinos, right? Um, as well as African Americans. Very few whites left, if any, anymore, right? And congressional delegations the same way. Uh, so I think there is, um, a visibility that's unprecedented, um, but there's at the same time. I mean, what is the Democratic Party in Texas? A minority party, um, one that hasn't seriously threatened for statewide office in decades. Um, so, you know, this is one of the ironies, maybe, of of what we sometimes call minority politics in America. Right? Latinos, as well as African Americans, managed to win a significant amount of control within local jurisdictions. Um, right, we have, thanks to the Voting Rights Act, there are districts now where people can pick a candidate of their own choosing, a candidate that looks like them. Um, they, it's easier to register to vote and vote, um, but what do you get for it? <laughs> you know, somebody to speak for your community, but one that doesn't ultimately wield a lot of power. I hope I answered the question. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> do you have another one? Yeah, I mean, it's like specifically that, what you brought up, which is that the, um, you know, how do you go from you know, 70s and 80s, Raza Unido Party in a place like Zapata to the sort of right-wing politics we see there today? Well, I don't know. That, I mean, that's your area, but I think it's, um, I mean, I, 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 your, your talk raised a lot of questions for me. I, I'd say one thing, and I think you wrote this elsewhere, right, but Tejano as, a, as an identity, um, you know, it was used at different junctures, uh, and it emerges again in, in force in the 70s and 80s as, as an alternative, um, not just to Mexican, but to Chicano, yeah. right, uh, as, a, as, a, as a moderate alternative. Uh, and that was before Hispanic really gained wide currency. Um, and then it continued forward. So in, in Texas, for example, when they built the Hemisphere and the Institute of Texan Cultures, you know, the idea is we're going to create this pluralism where Tejanos are basically the same as Czechs and Poles and everyone else. Um, and, and it was an act of whitening and of erasure and, and certainly a reaction to, to the Chicano movement in terms of the storytelling about those, uh, those people. Um, so, yeah, how do we explain that? I mean, I think the, 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 the places you've pointed us are right on. Um, I would, I guess, just add that South Texas has been tough territory for organizers, right, uh, and for people on the left, um, and for Mexicans um, and Mexican Americans. Um, you know, to, to one of the many points, this, this question of census data and how do people self-identify, right, it's fascinating to me that the numbers you just shared. Um, but you know, in the 1950s, and probably still now, 
if you're in South Texas and you're of Mexican descent and you're at least sort of mestizo in your phenotype, um, it really doesn't matter what you identify as. Right? <laughs> because yeah. when you walk into those white institutions, you're still a dirty Mexican, right? And that's how Texas had constructed Mexicans for so long. Um, and I, I think even now, we're not rid of that heritage at all, right? So um, it's almost an aspirational whiteness you're describing, right? And, I think precisely, and, yeah. Yeah, and in a, in, in a nation of racial formation that doesn't allow for that yet, yeah. uh, whatever. And uh, anyway, I, I think that's really fascinating. Um, so yeah, thank you for the question. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'll put it back to you then. Um, I was wondering, uh, you know, in that area, if you could think about in your research, you know, the ways in which sort of urban and, and younger Latinos challenge some of the stories of their elders in the region, or to what extent you've been able to uncover that? Yeah, I think that that, I'm glad you asked that question, because I think that that's one of the most poignant dynamics at play right now. Um, I think it's, it's telling and useful that there are such battles over the words that we use for ourselves, that there is not you know, a single accepted word. Like, you know, I have friends that the word Hispanic really bothers them because that erases a whole sort of lineage of just, you know, Spanish speaking. I, I think the clearest example is that there's a Latin American country that, you know, where <laughs> millions of people speak Portuguese. Um, plenty of other people in Mexico, you know, there are native born Mexicans who speak, you know, Nahua or Toteco and don't speak a word of Spanish. Um, other people have problems with Chicano because of its, you know, left-wing ideals, and other people have problems with Latino, and then everyone seems to have a problem with Latinx. <laughs> um, and I think that that, for me, those sort of debates that I started experiencing when I started, you know, experimenting with new words that I called myself, and I went and I talked to my parents or grandparents, and would use them sometimes, sometimes specifically to provoke a conversation, sometimes it would slip out and we'd have to have a conversation about it. But I think what happens is a dynamic that I've seen happening is at places like this, uh, a lot of people, a lot of young people for, with uh, Latin American backgrounds will go to university and take classes and start learning about this history in an in-depth way for the first time and learn about the organizing and social history that exists. And that's, for me, it was one of the most meaningful experiences of my life, uh, really starting to grow in an identity that I had been shamed for a lot in my youth. But I think the problem is, is that when you go to college, no matter what background you came from, when you go back to your community, college ha gives you uh, this new aura of class privilege. And I think that there's this dynamic where those of us who went to college, no matter what our background is, when we go back to our communities and we start you know, identifying as Chicano or using Latinx, it's not that people necessarily disagree with the sort of politics or self-conception we're bringing back, but a rejection of, of the words we're using or the attitude we have, which is, I think, at times condescending. And that's why I'm really you know, excited to read your book about the sort of organizing and identity formation and you know, a sort of progressive and liberation-minded identity that comes from places uh, without, without that sort of class privilege, you know, a, a, a identity from the bottom you know, instead of something that comes from the university and filters down. And I think that, that you know, if I'm to give advice to people organizing, you know, Latinos organizing in our communities, thinking about the ways in which that identity formation can be something that's organically being worked on and thought about and conceptualized among older folks and people who didn't go to college in the communities instead of just something that you go to your ethnic studies class, <laughs> you learn the right words, and then you go back and, and try and tell it to the, the old heads. here and uh, open it up to you all. I, I, I'm sure, and I hope that you've got questions among you. So if you've got something you'd like to ask of, of either or both of our guests, please throw your hand up um, and we'd love to hear from you. We've got one, a couple on this side. If, uh, if we have mics, someone? Oh, okay. Give us just a second then. Can we start right here in the back? We've got someone who right here has got a question. 
Thank you. Thank you both. Very, very interesting. So I do have two questions, uh, and I appreciate your honesty uh, on, on, uh, at the beginning about how this is complicated, right? So my name is Edward Retta, by the way, local guy. So this is being documented everywhere. Washington Post, New York Times, National Public Radio, Texas Tribune, Wall Street Journal had something out this, this Texas week. Texas Monthly. I think, yesterday, yeah. Uh, there's even a video online at Georgetown University called What's Going On with the Latino Vote, right? And this is not just a South Texas thing, right? I'm saying this for the sake of our audience, and, and I'll come to my questions, I promise. Uh, in 2020, the Florida vote among Latino voters shifted away from the Democrats by 28 points. In Texas, it was 18 points. In Wisconsin, it was 18 points. In Nevada, it was 16 points. In Pennsylvania, 12 points. In Arizona, 10 points. So this isn't just the South Texas thing, right? Indeed. So, you know, what, I, I, thank you for saying it's complicated. So one of you gave a list of hypotheses. I'm going to close with a, a potential one. So what, what, what is going on here? I know it's complicated. Uh, could it be, and this is a question for both of you, could it be that uh, some Hispanic Americans, Latinos, whatever you want to call us, are actually rejecting the victimhood paradigm, right? For every story like Porvenir, there are stories of successful Latinos, Hispanics who have made it in this country, like my uncle who dropped out of high school, who served in the U.S. Army in World War II, went on to found three businesses and died a multimillionaire. So I know there's a lot of Puerto Vendier stories, but there are thousands of stories across the United States of people like us actually making it and achieving the American dream. So what, what's really going on here? And, and is the rejection of this victimhood mentality possibly part of it? And when we inquire on this, why is it that we have to dig so hard and try to come up with hypotheses. Why can't we just say maybe uh, Joe Biden's policies are hurting families? Thank you. Mind if I take that one? Go ahead. Yeah, no, I mean, I think that a big part of the reason why I focus on South Texas is that I think as a reporter, I always try and know my beat, which is that when I say that is know what I know what I'm talking about and know what I'm, when we're talking about something that I just don't have the information on. And there has been a pronounced shift among a whole host of Latino communities nationwide towards the right in the 2020 election. I will note that it was mostly a shift towards Trump. The down ballot didn't reflect it in the same way. Um, Trump, I think, you know, that's another hypothesis is that he is an iconoclastic candidate, to say the least. Um, and, you know, provides interesting results when somebody like him is on the ballot. Um, I think that absolutely there is a rejection of the Democratic Party messaging. I think that that, especially uh, during the Biden campaign, I think that the Biden campaign did not message well to Latino communities. I think that there uh, were very fair accusations of pandering. Um, you know, Toros con Biden isn't, isn't an actual policy for Latino communities. It's just, you know, a, a slogan. Um, and I don't think that the, that administration that, that the campaign did a fantastic job reaching out, and they were warned by people uh, like the Castro brothers that they weren't doing enough to reach out to Latino communities. Um, I also think that you know, for decades, for a century, there's you know, if we go back just election after election, between 30 and 40 percent of you know, in, in exit polls, 40, for between 30 and 40 percent, sometimes more than 40 percent of Latinos are voting for Republican candidates. So it's not that there's like never been Latino conservatives or everyone's suddenly flipping. Like there's a very strong and coherent and generation long conservative Latino presence. You know, I, I think that that's part of why I wasn't surprised when I saw the vote in South Texas, or at least not as surprised as other people that, of course I've got conservative family members. And of course, you know, when a lot of the people I talk to, you know, it's not just like, oh, I, a lot of people were, you know, turned off by democratic politics over the years and had switched parties. But a lot of them, you know, my, my grandfather voted for Reagan, you know, like my, uh, you know, my dad, you know, raised me with these politics. It's a, it's a long coherent thread there. And so the, <laughs> by having my hypothesis say that there is no answer, one answer for why it's happening, uh, I think that conveniently gives me room to say like, yeah, sure. Like, I do think that that's part of it. I think that, you know, like there are people, I don't think it's, uh, you know, describes everyone 
and I don't think it describes the whole community, certainly, but I do think there are a certain number of people who like this, the narrative and the, the words that not just Democrats, but people on the left use to understand conceptual Latino identity as like a, you know, as, um, as a, you know, as a, maybe carries a sense of marginalization or a sense of, uh, I think that, that there, is, there is a rejection there, as you say, of a, of, uh, to use the words, a victim, a victim narrative. And that's something I have heard from other people. Do I think that that explains why the vote is happening the way it is? I don't. Um, I think that it's one answer for some people. Um, it's a long rambling answer. So I'll finish it up and to say that like, I do think that you make a really good point, which is when we talk about white voters and why they vote a certain way, we tend to say like, they prefer that person's policies. You know, we don't, we don't, we don't, we don't make it more complicated than that. And when we say, did you know that voter, white voters in Berkeley voted differently than white voters in Midland, Texas? No one goes, really? Did white people, are, they're voting differently. <laughs> but they're but they're white. Like they, don't they? They all vote the same, don't they? I think that we don't we don't afford that same sort of individuality. And I think that so I really appreciate that point. That yeah, like you know when when it comes to hypothesis, when it comes to like, why people voted for Trump, they liked Trump. Yes, absolutely. I think that's definitely the case. But I think that you know for historians and I think reporters too, it's getting deeper. Which is what about a social history? A, you know, personal history. A, his, a, you know, a, the story of a region describes why people would like somebody like Trump. You know, I think that people aren't very always good at knowing why they voted the way they voted. You know, it's, so what, what, are, what are those deeper motivations? And those are the questions I'm very interested in and will never be able to answer. Um, but people keep paying me to write about them, so. Is there a quick, there's at least one over here. Yes, ma'am. Got a mic right behind you. I'll come to you next. I've got a double question. First of all, would you believe that I met a man named John Leadham in Dallas, Texas in about 1974? And he says, well, I was the Republican Party of Dallas County chairman. And I could hold a committee meeting in a booth at Kipps when we started. And... Uh, Prior to that time, there were just about no Republicans in Texas. We don't seem to remember that John Tower was the first Republican elected. Now, another question, my real question is, those of us who identify as whites would like some credit for cooperation, encouragement, and helping to develop all of the civil rights advancements during the last three generations. I know my grandfather took great care of the black people that worked for him. I know that my mother and father never ever used the N-word or showed disrespect to blacks or Tejanos and neither have I. And here lately, all I get is you're a racist and you're a bad SOB, and I'm getting really tired of it. What can you say to that? Thank you for the comments. Um, I, I mean, I'll say a few things. So, you know, there was also Bruce Alger. Um, yeah, the, the Texas Democratic Party was a, a, a varied bunch. And as I write in my book, the dominant wing of the party were segregationists, white supremacists, Dixiecrats, as they often were called or called themselves. And in my book, I write a story about how other whites uh, actually disagreed with that position and tried to build uh, a liberal, multiracial Democratic Party. Um, there's, there was a problem in how they approached it, just as there's a problem in how Democrats try to attract Latino votes today. And one of those problems was that they believed that they were giving Latinos the tools to express themselves, that Latinos were incapable of political participation on their own, or African Americans as well. And they believed they were giving them this vote that they deserve credit for helping more. 
And all that that did was produce um, distrust and, um, and inability to successfully mobilize the people they were trying to reach. But there was a brief moment when these white liberals decided in the 1960s that they should stop taking credit for everything and instead um, listen to African Americans and Mexican Americans and ask them about their experiences and take their cues from people who are most affected by the presence of structural racism in America. And at that moment, suddenly their program started getting a lot of attention <laughs> in, in poor black and brown neighborhoods. It, it was a moment in which white folks could step back and say, I'm gonna listen, I'm gonna uh, not treat folks of color as junior partners in this uh, alliance and instead flip things around and dedicate ourselves to doing anti-racist work. Um, so, you know, a lot of those Southern white liberals said what you just did, that they had never um, used bad words or that they had never treated people with disrespect. But the bottom line is we live in a society in which one's opportunities and outcomes are shaped by structural racism. And so it wasn't good enough for them to say, to say those things, to make those statements about their intent, because their attitudes ultimately didn't matter that much, right? What mattered were these systems and what they were doing to dismantle them. And once they started to realize that, they could build an effective coalition in which white folks, African Americans, Mexican Americans, and others could actually treat each other with respect um, and see each other as equals. But as long as there was a sense that, well, folks owed white people something for, for not being terrible, uh, they didn't get very far. Um, I, don't, I don't think, I mean, I didn't call you a racist or an SOB, and I don't intend to. But, but I do think that those of us who are white benefit from the inequality that exists in society. And, um, and I think it takes a lot of work on our part to think about that and about how um, our experiences uh, of how racism functions or how economic inequality functions or, um, you know, what is, what is the impact of an, a ban on abortion. Like, these are things that me as like a straight white guy don't understand completely. And so I try to ask other people questions and listen to what it is they have to say. Jack, would yeah, you? Yeah, like if, if we could talk on that. I mean, I think that this kind of gets to what I was thinking about in terms of, you know, when you come back from a university setting or just even a lot of these spaces where you have a sort of leftist conceptualization of the world, you come back and you start, I think there's a disconnect when with a word like racism, which is that for some of us, I think, for, I think uh, I'll start actually for folks like yourself, where racism is very in, inter, interpersonal and, and attitudinal. That it's you know like a person's racist if they're using the N word, or if they're disparaging people of a different race, or they're harming them in some way, or you know burning crosses on their lawn. And I think that there's I think where the disconnect is is when people feel like they're being called racist, but don't do things like that. In fact, like you know find those, those sort of attitudes abhorrent, those sort of actions abhorrent. I think that the disconnect is happening is that there's another sense of racism, which Max, you know, I think structural racism is a, is a great word for it, which is this idea that racism and white supremacy in 2022 don't always look like just people saying, I don't like this person because of their race. Like, I'm not going to be nice to that person. It's something that happens on a level that we talk about unconscious bias, that's certainly something, but I think just in simple economic facts, that the fact that these counties that we're talking about in South Texas that I cover, you know, Zapata, Cameron, uh, Star, um, are some of, you know, are over, a lot of them are over 90% Latino, and they're also, you know, in the last, you know, the, some of them like basically are the last five poorest counties in the entire country. And I think the fact that Latino communities across this, this, the, the country are earning you know, fractions of the amount that white people are earning. I think the fact that you know, in the wake of Juan Crow and Jim Crow, the fact that even though we don't have to share segregation anymore, somehow the systems that we have in place have reproduced the same results as Jim Crow segregation. That educational segregation, schools are as segregated today as they were in 1960 after you know, a slight improvement in the 60s and 70s. Uh, income disparities between black and white people remain basically the same as they were under Jim Crow. Uh, educational achievement gaps, um, 
these things all still exist. And so I think that those of us who are, are, want to fight racism, which I think probably everyone, hopefully every, everyone in this room wants to do, it is about fighting those systems that perpetuate those outcomes and not just trying to fight this, you know, the sort of attitude that we think of when we think of a racist. Um, and I also, I'll, you know, I'll just, I'll just be frank, I think that no one congratulated me today for not shoplifting. And I don't think that, you know, white people, I, I think that, I think there's a lot of white people who deserve a lot of, a lot of respect and praise for their work in civil rights. There were white civil rights activists who were killed during the civil rights, the rights campaign. There are people who put themselves at danger in their community by standing up for what's right. I think that that's admirable and does deserve commendation. But when it comes to something like not using the N-word, that used to, <laughs> I don't think a person gets a cookie for it. You know, it's, it's not, it's, it's an obligation that we have. It's not a, uh, an achievement to not use a racial slur. Yeah. Let's do one more question um, from right um, over here. As a born in Europe, educated in Europe, <clears throat> and came to this country as a student, I did not have any of the baggage that it was in this country. I don't like Turks and Albanians, but anybody else in the States, I had no problems whatsoever. But I think a lot of what's going on right now has been going on through the centuries. There's always people that need to put somebody else down. And I think most of it is on fear because you don't act the way I do, you don't behave the way I do, you're not educated as I do, and you are bothering me. So we always try to have somebody a little bit higher than somebody else. It's like that um, you would go to a club and they won't let you in unless somebody liked you and they let you in. But the funny thing I've, I found, when I came to, Dallas, to Texas in 71, it was blue and later it changed. But I found that when Trump was elected and I asked some friends and people that I know in my building that they are of Mexican, Tejano, I don't know, but Spanish descent, why would they ever vote for somebody like that? And immigration to them and the border being blocked because they all said exactly like you said, I was here first, my family came out, you know, came in, but their family came in sometime crossing some kind of a border, whether was, it was lower or higher. So it, I think it's fear, and all of a sudden, like in Texas, the Spanish population is becoming higher than the whites, and the whites feel threatened for some reason because I don't know why. So now we have all these things that are going on. And the only thing I want to remark is that growing up in Europe, throughout Europe, we had such an extensive history that we study European history first, then we go to Asia, then we go to Africa. And if the semester allows you time, you cover the Americans a little bit. And the idea is, right, and the idea is that as far as we know as Europeans, uh, Americas were settled by Europeans. So unless you're an Aztec situation, we consider Americans, uh, just the North but the South, white people. We never said, oh, they're brown. I, I, ne I had never heard that brown. So I wonder now if, if a Spanish person goes to Europe, do you still feel comfortable? Nobody says, oh, you're Spanish, we're not gonna talk to you. Or you're brown. By Spanish, you mean somebody from Latin America, not the Iberian Peninsula. Yeah. I'm sorry? By Spanish, do you mean somebody from Latin America? Or uh, Well, um, yeah, I would say South America, Mexico, and, mm -hmm. and down. We, we don't consider them brown or whatever. They're white people. Because maybe they were settled by Spanish people for the Europeans and they're white. That was the idea. It makes me think uh, one time in a bus uh, outside of London, I, um, there were a couple of uh, Colombians on the bus. I recognized them, their accent. We started talking and we chatted for a bit. And I think it was fun because in, in, in England, I hadn't run into other Latinos in a while. And 
one of them said as they were leaving, they're like, like, mijo, ten cuidado, porque los blancos son indígenas <laughs> en esta isla. Like, you know, basically like the white people, you gotta be careful because white people are indigenous on this island. <laughs> and I mean, I think that's just like, uh, this is something I, I point out that um, race, the situation of race in Latin America is just is deeply complicated. Um, I think it's, you know, it's, it's, almost, it's too much to get into just in a quick answer, but in, there, I think that that's the thing is when people from Latin America, you know, from Mexico, for instance, cross the border, we're immediately racialized in this country, but on, it's not like racism doesn't exist in Mexico or race or Mexicans understand themselves as one race. I think there is a lot of push to say, you know, all mestizo are all mixed, but there is just very clear racial lines where darker skinned indigenous people, people who don't speak Spanish as well because they speak you know, mixteca or what have you, enormous amounts of discrimination. A lot of the towns, you know, don't have, uh, haven't been, uh, you know, the government hasn't invested in services as simple as electricity and running water. And of course, black Mexicans, uh, you know, experience pretty overt racism on a, daily, on a daily basis in a lot of parts of Mexico. And I think that that's one of the difficulties of, I mean, I think you, you use a you know, European trying to come and understand a new context in the United States. I think that that's, that's a difficult thing for us all to, you know, when I conceptualize Mexico or, you know, or another country in Latin America, just trying to understand the racial dynamics at play there, it's a, it's a, it's a real struggle. And I think that that's part of the problem, which is that in this country, those racial dynamics that exist within the community, within Latinos, Latinidad, when we say that like our communities are presented as a monolith, those are entirely ignored. You say that like, oh, you know, they're Latino, so they're Latino. There's not, there's not a, a you know, second asterisk to put, you know, another thing to say after that. And I think that that's, that's part of the problem. So to finish off this long rambling answer with another personal story about Europe is I, was, I did fine in Europe. I actually got called Turco in, in Italy, but I turned around and I said like, I look exactly like you, man. Like, <laughs> I don't know why I'm getting, you know, getting called, called names, but I think that it's because I, you know, I have European features and, you know, I look like I could have been Sicilian or, or Spanish or Portuguese. And so, you know, at least when I was in Southern Europe, no one gave me a hard time about that, but members of my family and loved ones who, look very obviously indigenous, you know, have the Central American or Mexican features, uh, their experience in Europe have been a lot different. Uh, you know, like my, my friend, um, uh, basically she was in a, in a, a hotel in, um, I think it was also England, and had a woman talking to her and she couldn't understand what she was asking her because she kept asking about her room and the woman was assuming that she was the maid coming to clean the room, but she was just also staying in the hotel. And so I think that that's just, that's a dynamic that, yes, I think Latin Americans will absolutely experience racism in Europe, but it depends what that Latin American's heritage, racial heritage is. I'll just say quickly that, um, I mean, your, your, your first point about the Turks and the Albanians, like this is truly, it, I mean, the immigration is a part of the question, right? Um, but so, Two is this longer history, and I'm a historian, so I'm going, to do, I'm going to give you a little history lesson, right? But these are not discrete stories, right? The reason we have um, these questions about victimhood or to what extent are, are Latinos, you know, repressed by structural racism is because Europe went and conquered the rest of the world, right? And they created, through the process of colonization, modern racial formations, right? They enslaved a bunch of people. They enacted a genocide against the whole continent of indigenous people, and then they seized land and put people to work for nothing or other sort of not unfree labor, right? And so in, in, in South Texas and in anywhere in the United States, that's, that's the story, right? So, um, you know, people began migrating because both Mexico had push factors and U.S. had pull factors. The big pull factor was that companies in the United States go to Mexico and other parts of the world and recruit workers because they don't want to pay them and they don't want to respect their labor rights. Um, so, you know, <laughs> the, 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 the stories that we're talking about, like they're not imagined. The, the economic indicators that Jack listed, right, they're not made up. Um, there is a victimhood narrative, but there's also a material reality that folks' life chances are not as good, 
And it's because of a long history in which labor exploitation was achieved through the propagating of racial difference. And, um, and we're still dealing with that legacy, and in fact, it's still being enacted. And you know, um, Europe has, for the first time in its history, really experienced mass migration from the global south. Um, and, uh, and more people before the pandemic were on the move than at any time in world history. Um, and that's because we, you know, the, these are the, the products of, of, you know, of capital accumulation, of globalization going back 500 years, um, and of the labor systems, right, the racialized labor systems that have built this world we're in. So, so yeah, it doesn't, you know, again, it's not just the attitudes, it's about how do we think about those systems Immigration is one little teeny piece of that, the way we normally talk about immigration. Um, so yeah, I'm not surprised that Tejanos in South Texas, some of them that, that Jack talked to would say, um, we don't like Mexicans, we don't like immigration. I mean, I interviewed people like that in South Texas as well. Um, but again, that's a, that's a claim on their part for Americanness. It's a claim to be accepted in the United States. And historically speaking, it's a claim that hasn't worked. They haven't been accepted. I want to encourage everyone, as you can obviously tell, it's, uh, it's complicated, and, but there's so much to learn, and there's so much we should be, continue to learn because these are issues that are with us now, and they're not going away. So I encourage you to go check out their writing. Uh, Max's books are for sale outside, and you can keep reading uh, uh, Jack's work through Texas Monthly and many other places. Please join me in thanking them for uh, speaking with us tonight. Thank you all, and we'll uh, hopefully see you next week at our next event in this room. <laughs>